Hi, my name is Dr. Lisa Hopp. I am a professor at the College of Nursing at Purdue University Calumet in Hammond, Indiana, and I'm also the director of the Indiana Evidence-Based Nursing Practice Center, which is a collaborating center of the Joanna Briggs Institute. Today I'm going to talk to you about doing it all with evidence, meeting standards, and maximizing outcomes. Have you noticed everyone wants to be evidence-based? They want to be evidence-based about psychology, about nursing, medicine, even architecture. I found a website that sums it all up, Evidence-Based Living. It's a translation it's a translational science unit at Cornell University with the aim of bridging the gap between research and real living. Here's their mission. Evidence-based living is built around the idea that scientific study should guide our lives in decisions we make for our families, in community initiatives, and of course in choosing medical treatments. We are truly accepting the idea that evidence should inform everything. Being evidence-based is not just about being informed with the research or knowledge. It's about taking action, measuring whether or not that action happened, and if that action worked, and finally, feeding what we learned back into the knowledge cycle. The translation science movement is really an old, old idea. But with each generation, we seem to have to rediscover the really important lessons. This quotation from Goethe made some time in his lifetime, he lived in the latter part of the 18th and early 19th century, is found in the early pages of every Institute of Medicine report. I believe they chose this quotation because it represents the challenge that is at the heart of being evidence-based about everything. That is, transforming our best knowledge into action. With those comments as background, let's get to the foreground and why you are listening. Our objectives today are to identify the strengths and weaknesses of data collection and analysis tools that organizations use to evaluate their ability to meet standards like core measures and of course to improve patient outcomes. We want to discuss transparent and effective treatments and methods to measure outcomes that reflect the best available evidence. And finally, identify ways that we can engage staff in being an integral part of the process to continually improve nursing practice and patient outcomes. Let's start with who cares about this conversation. Who's watching whether or not we use evidence to support not only our decisions, but also whether the outcomes and the methods that we use for measuring them are evidence-based? This figure represents only a handful of organizations, groups, power brokers, stakeholders that are guiding and watching how we use and demonstrate how we use evidence to support our processes, that's our clinical decisions, and our outcomes. Now I apologize these are quite US centric but I think that they apply regardless of what country you live in. We are all interested in making um, the most of patient outcomes and being evidence based. There are accreditors and agencies that support evidence based health care. Funders, regulators and of course patients and providers like us who care whether or not we choose to do what works and whether or not we know if what we did worked. When we say that we are evidence-based, what we mean is that we're using the best available evidence along with our clinical expertise and judgment in collaboration with patients and their preferences to achieve optimal patient outcomes. These are outcomes that merit reimbursement. Let's step back from that definition and examine its implications. Let's first talk about best and what it implies. First, for me, it implies that we can justify that the quality, that is the rigor, the strength of the evidence, the magnitude of the evidence, is as good as it currently gets. This implies that evidence has been judged, 
and appraised. Now available implies that someone has searched far and wide for what exists and that that search process, process was exhaustive. Let's use an analogy. If you buy a car and you're interested in that crash rating, you want to know first of all what the crash rating is, but also what it means, what that crash rating means. And finally you want to know that that car has been exhaustively tested if you're going to purchase and drive it and put your family in there. I think we need to ask the very same of the information we use to make clinical decisions. We need to know how good the evidence is and where it comes from and that it represents the best of what we know now. Clinical expertise for me is the glue of what makes evidence-based practice work. But clinical expertise does not mean just experience. Rather, it should be made explicit and reflect the wisdom that comes from reflective practice and the merit of that clinical expertise should also be judged like the evidence. Finally, patient preferences implies that the patient wishes have been explored, informed, and honored. So we need to know what the patient wants and there are now tools that are emerging that allow for shared decision making. That is, providing patients with the information reflective, again, of the strength and the magnitude of the evidence so they can be equal partners in decisions about their health. The goal is to net the best possible patient-centered outcomes and knowing what those outcomes are with confidence in both the objective data as well as the subjective experience of patients. Evidence-based practice has been our mantra for at least the last two decades and we are making progress with both the progress and the goals of evidence-based practice. In order to live up to that promise or our pledge of evidence-based practice, we must uncover and make more transparent what the quality and the magnitude of the evidence is. And we need to do that when and for those that count in the experience. This means connecting the quality and the magnitude of the evidence in an easy to access way. And I mean easy to access both technically and intellectually or cognitively. So that it's easy to get to and easy to understand. Providers need this at the point of care and when they engage patients in decision making. So we need the best tools and better tools that deliver that information when we are in the midst of making those decisions. So we are making progress towards making outcomes more transparent and available to the public and that's where I'm going to center the rest of my uh, discussion here. Since the early part of, the two, of 2000, hospitals have been asked to public report about certain outcomes. The idea, of course, is that my, by making us be more public about our outcomes, we'll be more accountable and the quality of care will more consistently be evidence-based and patient outcomes will improve. Starting first with just a small number of accountability um, outcomes and then adding more, leaders of that movement, most notably the authors of this particular citation that I have here, uh, come from the Joint Commission and they've worked with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. They believe that the proof of concept phase is complete and that this works. So here's some evidence to support that from that same public publication from the New England Journal of Medicine. In 2002, the Joint Commission required that accredited hospitals report on at least two of four core measures. That may seem like just a few, but that was 2002 and, and now you have many more to deal with. But these core measure sets um, re reflected the best available evidence. And this was the first time that hospitals used standardized measurement in the United States. 2002 was the first time that we used standardized measurement. These core measures represent whether or not well-supported therapies have been given to all the appropriate patients. 
Using a threshold of at least 90% compliance with the treatment, it's clear that since the public reporting began, compliance has greatly increased. This graph represents the percentage of hospitals that have met a threshold of 90% compliance. And in this case it is whether or not patients were given an ACE or an ARB for left ventricular systolic dysfunction. In 2002, under 20% of hospitals met that bar. And in 2009, nearly 90% have met that goal. The story is even more impressive when we talk about giving beta blockers to people who have had an MI, acute MI, um, by discharge. The percentage of hospitals who have met the bar of 90% adherence rose from just 49% in 2002 to nearly 97% in 2009. Furthermore, in 2009, 98.3% of all eligible patients received beta blockers compared with just 87.3% in 2002. And this comes from Joint Commission data. Similarly, in, with regard to antibiotics be given one hour before surgical incision, there was a sharp trend from hardly anyone getting it right in 2002 to over 90% getting it right in 2009. For stopping antibiotic use within 24 hours of surgery, this is, was a, is and continues to be a little bit harder than getting it started, but compliance is still much stronger in 2009 than it was in 2002. Not only have these individual measures improved, but overall the opportunities to use the core measures has grown by orders of magnitude. And the percentage of hospitals meeting that 90% compliance rate or better on all core measures has increased from just 20% in 2002 to nearly 86% in 2009. So what accounts for this improvement in delivering evidence-based treatments? Well, one element is accreditation and that makes a difference. From a 2011 study, accredited hospitals consistently outperformed non-accredited hospitals on 16 core measures. Accredited hospitals also had better performance at baseline. And this improvement was sustained and increased over time. The Joint Commission hypothesizes that these factors have helped make accountability measures work. So what makes for a good accountability measure? First of all, you have to measure what works, not what doesn't work. So you need to rely upon those interventions where the evidence is strong, both in quality and magnitude, because these are the ones that make a difference. Second we need standardized definitions. Prior to 2002, although the Joint Commission used OREX, everyone could develop their own standard definition and so uh, we weren't measuring the same thing and that makes comparisons very difficult. Thirdly, collecting and reporting the measurement just once to a central agency or organization certainly improves efficiency and the quality of the measurement. All of that packs a punch with measurement and using it for accountability, for payment and accreditation is what's making a difference. I mentioned earlier that being evidence-based about everything includes, includes using evidence to generate what and how to measure quality and effectiveness. So it isn't just about using evidence to inform what we should do, but also using evidence to inform how we get it into practice and using evidence to inform the outcomes and how we measure those outcomes. So when it comes to constructing accountability measures or any other type of measurement for that matter meant to improve quality and safety, the leaders of the Joint Commission advise that these four criteria be met. First, there needs to be a strong evidence base that shows that the care practices leads to improved outcomes. And this shouldn't be based on a single study, rather meta-analyses with strong effect size. Second, the measure needs to accurately capture whether or not the evidence-based process has in fact been provided. 
Checkboxes do not necessarily mean that the process was delivered effectively. I know we rely a lot on checkboxes, but these folks at the Joint Commission understand that sometimes that doesn't mean that a treatment has actually been effective. So for example, if we just check off that heart failure teaching has been provided, it doesn't mean that the patient understands or is able to use those instructions when they go home. The measure needs to address the, a process that has few intervening steps between what must occur before the improved outcome happens. In other words, when you me what you measure needs to be downstream to the outcome rather than upstream. So for example, if we measure whether or not a diagnostic test was done, there's a lot of subsequent steps that providers need to take before an effective outcome will happen. Implementing the measure should not induce unintended consequences. For example, giving an antibiotic to uh, folks that arrive at the emergency room with a suspected community acquired pneumonia m could lead to overdiagnosis and overuse of antibiotics just because we're trying so hard to meet that measure. And so it's, diff it's difficult sometimes to anticipate what those unintended consequences might be. Accountability measures carry very high stakes. Accreditors and payers, or at least CMS, have worked together to develop highly rigorous standards. Everyday practice and doing what works for nursing care is not nearly so standard. Yet, we aim to provide nursing care using the best available evidence. The criteria for measuring what we do and if it makes a difference remains challenging, but we can do it. Process measures tell us if the evidence-based practice has happened, assuming that the criteria actually reflects the evidence, and provides opportunity, if measured, to improve the process. Patient outcomes are what we aim for, but I do uh, remind you that outcomes often need to be risk-adjusted and need uh, some further work. This isn't to say, though, that we shouldn't measure outcomes. We certainly should, but we need to bear in mind that risk adjustment may be important. How do we use data for measurement to improve practice? Does our obsession with auditing process and outcome work to actually enhance evidence uptake and care and the use of evidence-based guidelines? In other words, if we use the science of implementation, can we improve process? This figure represents the findings from a systematic review about the effectiveness of audit and feedback on health professionals using evidence-based processes and on patient outcomes. This was a systematic review of 49 randomized controlled trials, that's lots of studies far from a single study, and included 82 comparisons. In general, while the magnitude of the effect wasn't large, the soundness of the evidence is moderate. And so when we use audit and feedback, we need to consider these recommendations about what works from this systematic review. First, audit and feedback will have a bigger impact when baseline conform performance is lower. When giving feedback, the targets and the actions the person needs to take need to be clear and explicit. Third, feedback should be provided in both written and verbal ways. And that feedback has to happen generally more than once. Finally, it's better if the person giving the feedback is a colleague or a supervisor. So these are maybe sounding common sense, but they're what the evidence says works best when we use audit and feedback. Given these sources of evidence, the recommendation for what makes a solid accountability standard and what the evidence says about how to use audit and feedback to improve uptake of evidence, what should you look for when you're looking for tools and approaches? First, let's talk a little bit about the evidence source. Remember, the evidence should be strong both in terms of its quality or its rigor and its so what factor, that is the magnitude of the effect. Ideally, the evidence to support what works is at the point of care. The information should be easy to access, both, both in terms of the technology used to reach it and the intellectual energy that you need to use it. The sources should be transparent. That is, the evidence of the evidence should be available to the person using it. 
and the strategy to find the best available evidence. What went into finding and rating and saying this is what you ought to do, that should also be available to the decision makers. The criteria needs to capture the process. So the audit criteria needs to represent the evidence. We shouldn't be looking at the evidence and then creating other criteria. They should be linked. They should be looking at the very same thing. The criteria must also be directly observable. Since most compliance reporting is in the form of rates, you need to know what the numerator should be and what the denominator should be. And finally, the auditor must have a, a clear present or absent option to measure. It should be very clear if something is happening or not. Other ideal criteria relate to capturing the process include you need to make the audit process efficient. Handheld devices with easy to use data collection tools are ideal. The analysis of the data should be easy. A couple of clicks would be really great rather than having to have in-depth knowledge say of Excel. Feedback works best when it is immediate and when it can be graphically displayed in an easy to understand manner. The audit process needs to be fully scalable from unit to whole organization to allow for both internal process improvement and learning and external benchmarking. In order to meet the downstream criteria I mentioned, the audit should be based on processes that are clearly linked to outcomes. Using directly observable metrics and not proxies, for example, observing that full prairie precaution was used rather than counting inventory is an example of a proxy measure, the counting inventory versus actually seeing if full barrier was used. Use standard evidence-based criteria, yet you need to be able to customize those to the context. But be cautious, you don't want to undo the evidence in your effort to be uh, more contextually relevant. For example, you may want to identify whether the information can be found and where it can be found, but not change the criteria itself. For example, if the routine is to document when a urinary catheter was inserted on a tape around the catheter to determine insertion in dwell days, that's okay, but it isn't okay to eliminate the criteria that the catheter is discontinued, say, by post-op day one. So this may seem like a very tall order. You may be faced with developing your own tools, but do them carefully to meet the standards that pack a punch. Look first for measurements that already exist. It's in the midst of the movement towards accountability and pay for performance. Many tools have emerged and they will continue to become available. I will introduce you to one that I am particularly fond of because it is so focused on the evidence. It reflects the best practice related to audit and feedback and includes nurse sensitive processes and outcomes. And that's the Paces and Pool tool that the Joanna Briggs Institute has um, developed. But other measures that can be very helpful include those from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. It's home to the National Quality Measures Clearinghouse. And the measures that show up in that clearinghouse have been evaluated according to several criteria, including the importance of the measure, the scientific soundness of the measure, and three, the feasibility of using that measure. You will find links to the health and human resources measure as well, though these metrics may not meet the same criteria or same rigor that uh, the AHRQ has associated with their measures. Some clinical practice guidelines also include metrics that for audit and feedback. The Registered Nurses of Ontario organization has excellent practice guidelines that includes how to measure whether or not the process has happened and um, whether or not uh, how to measure outcomes with clear numerators, denominators, etc. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement Tools also are a good source to look for. Many of you are familiar with the NDNQI, particularly if you're a magnet organization, you're aware of those 18 different outcomes, and these include nurse satisfaction uh, measurement, and the National Quality Forum, Forum is driving and shares some of the same metrics with other organizations.
So let's talk a little bit more about the PACES and Pool tool from the Joanna Briggs Institute in their partnership with Walters Kluwer Health and Ovid Lippicott, Williams and Wilkins. JBI Connect Plus is a bundle of tools aimed at knowledge transfer and utilization. The tools begin with knowing what to do. They begin with the evidence in the form of a brief evidence summary. You can easily search it using usual tools. It includes when you find that source, it includes where that came from, what the level of evidence is for each recommendation. It ends with a very brief bottom line clinical recommendation about what to do. The next step is to audit. And so you can find easily those criteria that go along with that practice. You can select it. They are observable. Those criteria have been vetted based on the evidence summary and the criteria themselves have been vetted to make sure that they are observable. You can set up a unit-based or an institution-based audit. You can even determine sample size if you're doing an institutional-based audit for how many samples should be taken, how many observations should be taken per unit. You can collect the data using a handheld device like an iPad or an iPhone. You can create an immediate graphical representation of both baseline and subsequent audits. No Excel required. You can identify then quickly what areas of practice need to be worked on and which areas of practice can be celebrated. Embedded in the technology is a simple action planning tool called GRIP, Getting Research Into Practice, and you can use that to immediately engage your stakeholders right there when you're looking at that data to create some solutions appropriate for that context, identify barriers, set targets, even receive email reminders. Then you re-audit, compare, and continue that cycle learning from each audit. Here's a picture of uh, PACES at work, you could say. This was uh, some work that I did with our undergraduate students at Purdue University Calumet, where they're using iPads and conducting a PACES quality improvement cycle to improve the care of pressure ulcers in a long-term acute care setting. It was quite successful. The last thing I want to talk about is how to engage nurses in all of this. Bedside nurses, of course, are busy caring for patients in the midst of highly complex work and environments. Yet, they are absolutely key to maximizing evidence-based outcomes and enhancing care. As you think about how best to engage nurses, my first recommendation is to ask them. But be aware of how much you are asking of them. Over and over, frontline nurses say they value evidence-based practice. They, of course, want good outcomes for their patients. But the biggest challenge for all of them is time. Managers are faced with the same challenge and are accountable for the hours that nurses spend, spend with patients. As managers make difficult decisions in the face of doing more with less, if they pull professional nurses away from patients, away from where the nursing work happens, to do non-nursing work, they cannot expect that nursing care will improve. Engaging nurses in the process of evidence-based practice and improving care has big payoffs. Here's some recommendations. First of all, provide incentives through the clinical ladder. Incorporate involvement in evidence implementation and the mentoring of others in the upper levels of merit. Use your shared governance councils led by staff, supported by your organiza organizational structure and culture to create a learning healthcare system. Leaders influence organizational culture through expectations, norms, artifacts, etc. So create a culture of evaluation where collecting data is a seamless system. An expectation, but make it efficient so that we can exploit the electronic record and that huge investment. Models of evidence implementation indicate that expert facilitation is key to success. These facilitators need to be expert in finding, assessing, and contextualizing all sources of evidence, whether that's the best available evidence from research or local data. They understand and influence the context through leadership, 
through evaluation practices and as brokers of the organizational culture and as brokers of knowledge. They then determine the best way to facilitate evidence implementation. Clinical nurse specialists and other advanced practice nurses who have been appropriately prepared for this work are absolutely well suited for this role. Use the right tools for the job provided at the point of care. All nurses need to have access to web-based information sources and the tools need to become smarter. Some staff nurses should be engaged in data gathering. Some of them, perhaps not all of them. But all nurses need to be able to assess and understand the critical process and outcome measurements. Feedback should be targeted, presented in a graphical and easy to understand way. Infographics, for example, are a good way to make the um, outcome results very understandable and relevant. And so this work needs to be right at the heart of what nurses are doing and what they care about. Staff nurses have incredibly creative and solution focused ideas when asked on how to solve problems. They need to be engaged in the action planning. Leaders need to understand what the complexity of work looks like and that nursing work is adaptive. This is a seven hour afternoon shift of a very typical work day. These data were collected by Dr. Emily Patterson. She is a human factor scientist in collaboration with Dr. Pat Ebright from the Indiana University School of Nursing and I thank them for this slide. They were trying to understand the complexity of nurse work. She documented everything she saw. She followed a nurse around for these hours, observed them, made marks of, uh, on the timeline of what they were doing. But of course, this does not reflect the unobservable work, the cognitive work that is happening at the same time. So I think this picture really illustrates how complex the work is what it looks like and we need to bear that in mind when we're asking nurses to do more. The Institute of Medicine has set a goal that I think reflects the challenge that I've spoken of today. By 2020, 90 percent of clinical decisions will be supported by accurate, timely, and up-to-date clinical information and will reflect the best available evidence and informed personal preferences. I thank you for your attention.